Hello and welcome to another episode of the Collab Talk podcast, where we discuss the convergence of technology, business productivity, and collaboration culture. My guest today is Laura Rogers. Hello, Laura. Hello, Christian. She is a consultant, trainer, a fellow Microsoft MVP, and the CEO of IW Mentor, providing online training courses and consulting services for the SharePoint ecosystem and beyond just the SharePoint, just the SharePoint. But welcome to the uh, to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's uh, I, it's like well, I think so. I met you in two thousand nine. I think that's like the that sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. So I left Microsoft. Oh yeah, the the big earlier. SharePoint conference. The big yeah. SharePoint conference. There was a couple like I did. I don't remember who party. came out. Like the SharePoint Saturday in in Seattle, which was on Microsoft campus, just after that conference in mm -hmm. Vegas. Um, and a few people came out for that as well. But, well, we're talking today uh, about the future of work with personal and team automation. And Laura, since you do so much with automation, I thought perfect time to have Laura come in, share some of her experiences, the things that she's, the conversations that she's having around this. But why don't you tell more folks about you and what your company does? Uh, well, I have been working in SharePoint for about 20 years. I have a SharePoint background. I um, first started out by, I was, an, I was an exchange admin and they oh. threw SharePoint at us and said, go learn this. And it goes with our collaborative, collaboration and messaging uh, server team that I was on so that they figured that's uh, where they needed to put those servers. And they sent us to training and I met, that's where I met Bill English. And this was in 2004, no, 2000. Five or six. <laughs> okay. No, yeah. So um, this was a training on SharePoint 2003. So he, in the training, he said, is anybody interested in writing a chapter in my SharePoint 2007 book that I'm writing? And so I, that's how I got my foot in the door. I wrote a chapter for the Moss Administrator's Companion. Huh. And then that's how I was able to start speaking at conferences and got, became an MVP and the rest is history. And now um, IW Mentor is um, our small company. It's um, consulting around SharePoint, Power Apps, you know, automating business processes. And I have a whole set of online training courses that I've created. It's uh, self-paced. It's hours and hours and hours of SharePoint, Power Apps, Power Automate, building business processes and teams, forms, everything. Yeah, I had the, uh, the you know, subscribe and I've got the, uh, of course, follow, get the notifications of all the new stuff that pops up there. And um, so always with, with your, the, the similar background, sometimes the purple, sometimes the green and things out there, but, uh, see that stuff come across and, uh, and, and always point people over to Laura's content is you've always created great content. And I know you're one of the people too, that early on kind of embraced doing more of the video content and creating video assets out there for the. All right. And my YouTube channel is Wonder Laura. Of course. And you can that's find. Hour hour on Wednesdays at 11. So tomorrow. That's the stuff. Yep. Uh, constantly see it out there. What do you think is happening with, you know, automation in general? I mean, it, it, it used to be something that was, um, you know, completely the purview of IT and not that Microsoft completely moved the needle across. There were a lot of other consumer-based solutions and apps, and there were different tools to allow you to link different you know, disparate tools together out there. But when Microsoft really turned their attention, certainly within this ecosystem, to do the, the whole idea of no code, which I believe is a complete lie. There is no no code. It's low code um, solutions out there. Like what, what's what been happening? What's the evolution of the automation space? Ooh, the evolution. That's a, that's a great question. Um, well, I have always loved automation. I'm really lazy. So I like just automating as much as I can ever since, you know, word macros, and uh, I used to have a macro, I would, uh, in 2000, so 24 years ago, I would get to my desk in the morning and push play on my macro and it would do all this stuff, do my spreadsheets, it would pretty much do my job for me. So um, I've always been a huge fan. So as soon as I learned about um, SharePoint Designer, you know, when it first came out, started building workflows. Um, so it went from 
um, SharePoint designer workflows are pretty much like the first tool from uh, what you're talking about with the Microsoft tools. And then that evolved to pretty much Power Apps and Power Automate were what came next. And there's a lot that you can do in Power Automate, in, in Power Apps, that kind of automation type things without even needing Power Automate. So it's always kind of interesting kind of figuring out which one of those you need for kind of different parts of your process. But um, yeah, it's it's the tools are pretty basic. It's pretty much Power Automate is the Microsoft tool to use to automate things. But um, it Microsoft has so many different apps and services now that it, there are hundreds of things that you can automate from within there. So, and they keep throwing out new products. Like, you know, you have Microsoft Forms, you have Loop, you have Planner, you have like this Planner to do. So you have all these things that you can, ways that you can think about kind of merging together um, what you're doing and automating it. And then just really, it's a matter of an individual person thinking of, what do I do on a daily basis or on a weekly basis that's rote and boring and how can I automate this? So it's really, um, I guess that's kind of the answer is to think about what you need to automate that's boring and as far as personal automation and then um, pick, you know, kind of understand which tool is the best. You know, one, one thing, and, and, and even when I talk about you know, even outside disparate tools, outside of the ecosystem, I, you know, when I started experimenting, I can't remember what year it was when you had uh, IFTTT. So if this, then that, and yes. Zapier and other external platforms. And what's cool about that is, uh, and sometimes I've like had an idea for something and I look up on like the Zapier app on my phone just to see if there are already you know, playbooks or modules, things that are created, people, automations that are already out there to connect certain things, uh, to be able to do. I know there are some people that have gone from a personal productivity uh, standpoint, um, really automated with the smart lights and devices in their homes oh, and yeah. speakers and I've all those kinds of things to be able to do things. Like at one time I had it wasn't, it's not on the to-do, but what was the, uh, what was the previous version that of the, uh, the list app that Microsoft acquired and kind of folded in, or I guess they killed that product. Um, trying I was trying to remember the name of it. You know what I'm talking about mm. though? Yeah. Vaguely. Yeah. There was a, there was another, uh, it'll, it'll come to me. I'll yeah, shout no, out I'm the name. Kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, and I'm not, that's why you don't hear my, uh, uh, my, my keyboard going looking for it. But anyways, so they acquired a company that did that, that I used and, had some automations where I could um, notify my smart device whose name I won't mention in the window. Otherwise she'll, I'll have to yell at her to be quiet, um, but to create tasks. And I could use Siri through my phone as a, on my iPhone as I'm driving and would do the same thing. It would add that to my, that, uh, that listing app. Now it's bothering me. Now I've got to look it up. <laughs> Um, I use Zapier as well. I have the LMS system that I use is called Thinkific. That's where all my training is created. So it has nothing to do with SharePoint or Microsoft. And so Z but Zapier has a connector for Thinkific. So then I'm able to do automations like when students enroll and have it go, you know, put them in my newsletter and things like that. So, but I'm, yeah. And I'm not seeing the name pop up here. That's going to bother me. But anyway, but anyway. But yeah, I mean, that, that kind of stuff to be able to go and do, you know, complex activities. Like another example of what I've talked about, I was talking with somebody about like even doing like the podcast to, to be able to set an automation so that it knows when I, uh, when I publish to my blog a new episode to go in and send a thank you email to the person who is the guest with a link to the blog post, like automate that. Like that's on my, it's literally written down on my manual it's, list, my sticky note to go and build that automation to go and do that. So it's I- like you, you need to forget. stop what you're doing and spend time, maybe a few hours building the automation, but you'll save yourself so much time in doing it. So, so you're talking about the concept of personal productivity versus- like team, like, I guess, bigger business processes. It's interesting. It's kind of where you draw the line between that. It's like one of the first examples I think about with productivity, it's kind of a personal productivity, but it kind of bleeds into the whole team. So 
back uh, where I used to work, there was a woman that had a spreadsheet of all the vendors we do business with. So she would email this spreadsheet out to 50 people, tell them all to make updates to the spreadsheet and mail email them back to her. And then they'd email them back to her. She'd print them all out and spread them all over her desk and figure out what changes people made. And then she'd go back and type them all into the main spreadsheet. And I went up to her and I said, look, here's this thing called a SharePoint list. You just put the spreadsheet and make it become a SharePoint list. And then you just send the people the link to it and they can all just update it right there in one place. So it's like, uh, like hours. Yeah. Time well, saved. Well, that's, and I, I think of the difference between that because I think personal productivity, again, that can, you can define that in different ways. What I, the things that I need productivity around might not be tools or process things that you're doing in, in your life. When I think of team-based productivity, I think of, well, something that is within the framework of our company system of our, uh, within our network around the tools that are approved, the platforms that we, that we use, and that can be supported by are scalable within that organization, supported by my company, mm -hmm. um, yeah. for example. So many of my, like my audience, my people, my students, so many of them are either small and medium businesses or they're like the IT person. And so since I work with more people like that, they're more along the lines of, I have this process that I need to make more efficient. IT knows nothing about it. They're not going to help me. They don't even know who I am. I just want to make, do this form or do this process to, like I had a customer yesterday that was, she has a spreadsheet and she has a list, a subset of the spreadsheet she needs to send to each of the project managers on a weekly basis. And she needs it to send this list of things to each person and for them to do something like approve or reject. And it's really like kind of personal productivity because it's just making her job easier, but it's kind of, you're including everyone because it's like a team, it's project managers, but IT isn't, doesn't necessarily know anything about these tools. In this case, they're, they're just actually kind of like the ones that are blocking her from doing things like blocking certain actions in power automate. And so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely, I work more with the people that are just kind of renegade in a way of just wanting to go like make something more efficient, just do it. Just you work in the shadows, form. in the shadow yeah, IT, yeah. you work in the shadows. That's yeah. what it is. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, but that's, uh, I mean, again, when I, when I think of this question of like the, the future of automation around that is that organizations, large or small, need to be thinking about, you know, like how much can we set up our users, whether there's. 20 people in the organization or 200,000 people in the organization, how can we set up and provide uh, the, the right tools for them to go and solve some of these problems? Because you're right. I mean, sometimes Unfortunately, most times they don't want to. They want to block things. They want to lock things down. Right. Yeah. But I, I get that from a security standpoint, Yeah, uh, like wanting to have those guardrails in place. But, but that's, again, that's the difference that I put around personal productivity and what, what I look at and go and do versus team-based. And it, it might be that it's productivity across multiple people within an organization, but it also might be that it's productivity for me, but done in a compliant, secure, managed way within the platform. That's what I'm saying. I, I think organizations need to understand where they sit, like the, the tools that they provide and what we will support, pro provide those guardrails and then let people go and solve within those those guardrails. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, it's, I, it's, yeah. it's fun how contagious it is because somebody will create a Microsoft form or a SharePoint list, Microsoft list, and then other people in another department will be like, oh, what's that? How'd you do that? And then it kind of catches on and then you get all like a lot more people starting to use these tools and realize how easy they are and realize how they can make their lives easier. I, I always think about, I, I love discussing the cultural aspect of this, of, you know, the, the differences between organizations that have it locked down, the culture of the organization where it's locked down, they don't let them do it, or only IT can go and build those versus an organization where they let people go and experiment and to build these automations themselves. I mean, do you see in, in your interactions with your clients, in, do you see differences between those two types of organizations? I, I, yeah, yeah, it definitely seems like in a lot of cases with the, maybe the, 
I'm not sure this if this is a specific size of the company, but you have IT sitting there not even realizing what people are doing with the technology. Like I had a customer one time that said, you know, they came to me, they said, maybe we'll start using this SharePoint thing. Let's talk about maybe rolling it out, creating an internet. And then I took a look at their environment. I said, you, you realize you have 200 SharePoint sites already. And they're like, oh, what? Yeah. <laughs> and well, people were already using it. People were already like, they just took it and ran with it. So I don't know if it's like maybe kind of the younger generation coming in and just kind of clicking around, figuring stuff out and just trying things. Um, or if it's a certain mindset, maybe, but um, there's, a, there's a lot of IT departments that um, maybe they don't know where to look. They don't know the admin interface, but they, uh, they're they just not aware of what people are doing out there. So it, it's, yeah, it's like as soon as they realize what they're doing, it makes them, they want to just like kind of clamp down on it. But yeah, it's going to, it would be, it would be nice to be able to have a conversation with those, like the, I, the IT people that just want to lock everything down and explain like exactly how you can implement governments, governance, how you can kind of understand what the tools are and how how it could be insecure and how, and like maybe places that you could look, but not necessarily just by default, you know, turn off Delve or turn off SharePoint, creating a site and things like that. Well, now, now you're, uh, you're meandering into the space that I work, which is around the governance and consulting with companies. Oh, yeah. you know exactly. To talk about <laughs> I'm that. I'm not a governance what, expert. What, what exactly <laughs> I know what the that, word, word that means. means. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's a, and another problem another area and we were talking before we started recording here about this is that you have the the issue that adds to a lot of that confusion uh is the whole which tool do i use and when and what are the right scenarios i mean how much do you hear that question oh uh, constantly that's why i did a session at um at the last microsoft community conference where i compared just for forms for form, building a, a form um, Power Apps versus Microsoft Forms versus a SharePoint list versus the new SharePoint list form interface that they just rolled out that's also on a SharePoint list and comparing like what they all do, when when to use what pros and cons of each thing. Yeah. Um, I get that a ton and I, I would like there to be just one form product. That would be optimal, I think. But um, yeah, it's, and, and also I, I've been starting to kind of looking more into like the newer products and kind of comparing them as well and bringing them into my comparison, like Microsoft Loop. Um, you can assign tasks in Microsoft Loop and they can actually be tied to your tasks in Planner and To-Do. And you can also kind of edit content in Loop and you can edit with Copilot and you can collaborate with people in there, but you can also collaborate in Microsoft Word on a document. So right. it's, it's tricky when it, it's kind of mind blowing. You see all the different ways you can kind of do the same thing yeah. within Microsoft 365. So, you know, it's like kind of Microsoft's message feels like just like, yeah, do, you know, use whatever you feel like using, just this will do this and this will do that. And, but a lot of people, they want to be told what to use. Yeah. What form product should I use? What product should I use for collaboration on a document? And, what specifically do I need to click on to go into Microsoft 365 or, or Teams and collaborate on a document with a coworker? So it's it's kind of confusing. I don't know. Maybe it kind of depends on the personality type of kind of just needing to be told what to do versus just kind of clicking around and figuring it out. No, but, I, yeah, I, yeah, I think it, it, that's the same thing I've run into as well, where I say like there's nothing wrong for a a team or a company to say hey, this is the way that we work. We use these tools in this way, which doesn't mean that if you run into a wall where the, the limited features of using Word where loop would make more sense uh, and and you not that you couldn't- But really how are you going to know, you know where those right. limits are? Well, then, yeah. and, and it takes people going out and, and experimenting. I mean, what generally happens with shadow IT, as you know, it's that people are trying to get their work done and whether they bring knowledge experience with other outside tools to, to the mix or, or not. Um, but you know, somebody says, look, you're only, you're limiting me to work in this way. Great example are companies that lock down their external sharing. It's like, well, you've got policies around email. I can't attach this massive document that I need to collaborate with this, partner this outside expert on 
it's funded, it's authorized that we're, they, the company knows we're collaborating on this. We've you know, maybe got an NDA in place. We still can't share files. What do they do? They go put it on their personal OneDrive and then share the link and collaborate. Yeah. Or they put it out in Dropbox or Box or some other, you know, they find a way. external side. They, they go around it. They have to get their work done and they find a way. So you locking down the system doesn't stop them from moving that forward. I mean, you can threaten it just them. Just kind of takes it out of your purview. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> right, but it's a. Uh, you know, that, I mean, that's that's the the problem with a lot of this. That's why my, I mean, I, when Microsoft acquired Yammer, so 12, 13, 14 years ago, was, it's, yeah, you know, it's a long long time ago. It reminds me of how old I am. Um, but when all that that went down, and and Microsoft was very much in SharePoint was in that locked down permission structure. It was very much locked ecosystem type of most of the customers. Yeah, I wanted that. Yammer's approach was, no, we want everyone to collaborate. Everybody has a voice in here. And so flatten the permission structure. And the new, the modern way of looking at intranets with SharePoint and collaboration platforms like, uh, you know, like Teams and using OneDrive and the sharing in between them and all those things is, to flatten, flatten your information architecture, rely more on, you know, uh, uh, metadata than, and your, you know, classification model, your labeling your as, hubs. instead of, yeah. instead of site nested sites within nested sites yeah. and folders and kind of all that complexity, uh, and then locking down permissions. It's good to, I always say that sprawl is good. And the reason sprawl, there's bad parts of sprawl, of course, but what it sprawl shows is that people are working and they're working together. And there's a lot of it. It's a lot of mess that you need to constantly clean up, but I'd rather have a mess to clean up than people not collaborating. Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. A, a lot of that boils down to when you have a SharePoint site, if you're just talking about collaborating in SharePoint, which of course is where all the files are, in case anyone doesn't know, OneDrive is SharePoint, Teams files are SharePoint. It's a lot of that is getting that owner of that site trained on what their responsibilities are when it comes to permissions. Now we're talking about permissions, which is not, <laughs> but um, but yeah, just ha you, you have to have some responsibility for when you're putting your files out there for somebody to sort of be in charge of, okay, I'm responsible for these files and I'm going to set the permissions on them so that you don't have this accidental. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's the, one of the benefits of like get back towards like the power platform is that you, you do have from a management, from an IT management um, perspective, you do have the ability to lock it down somewhat. Like, it, 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 like here's what you have access to. You could even then limit, um, you know, who in the organization, if they've, if they've been through some training before you authorize them to go and build and automate and do certain things. Yeah, um, but that's not the data. That's not the data. The data is not really in the Power App or the, or the Flow. So it, it's still like, even if they could create something, they have to have access to the data. Right. So it's like these companies want to lock down power apps and power automate, but that's not, there's not really that much, not much risk because people would have to have access to the SharePoint list or to whatever the database is to be able to automate it in the first place. So I don't know. I think it's, I think it's still along the lines of the database or where the data is and the permissions on that. That's um, as opposed to, whether people can use the power platform because that that's not data. It's a similar story with Copilot with all the AI push. Yeah, is that yeah. It's a, I mean, as far as personal productivity of, of, uh, of automating, I mean, uh, instead of going in and sometimes building a, a, a solution, if you don't have that knowledge, if you don't have the ability to go and build a, a, a complex workflow, it's like we're getting to the point where, I mean, Copilot will become intelligent enough and around your specific data. And, and as you point out, it's security trimmed, meaning I can only access that data, which I have access to. And I know with a lot of the AI tools, a lot of the concern is that, hey, it's, and this is, again, goes back just like Delve, back in the Delve day, where people would complain is, hey, people are seeing content, they're getting in their results from, uh, you know, co-pilot queries, data that they shouldn't see. It's like, 
no, Copilot's not bringing back results that they don't have access to. So it's a failure of, I mean, I just had an argument a couple of weeks back with a, with a gentleman on this exact point. Is that he's like, no, there's something it's that it's it's off. Like, like I know that that uh, I should not have permission to this. And I said, I'm telling you, in your system, there are conflicting policies, one that's restricting your access, the other one giving you access. And clearly that one is overriding the one restricting access. You yeah, have a SharePoint someone. search can find it. Yeah. Right. I said that's that's where you go and look. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I didn't hear back from him after that guidance. So <laughs> there wasn't additional feedback and hopefully he went and found where that, that was, but that's they're, one of those. They're those adding concerns. Copilot into every single product is so awesome. I have, I, we purchased Copilot here at IW Mentor and I'm, I'm having so much fun. Like every, every now and then a new product will have like the Copilot logo. It's like, oh, you can use Copilot in here. Now you can co use Copilot there. Um, another tool, speaking of personal productivity, and that Copilot is in now is have you ever tried the Flow Microsoft Power Automate desktop? Uh -oh. Speaking of, so you know how I was talking about back, you know, 20 years ago, I used to sit down at my computer and just push play on a macro and it would just do all these things. That's kind of that is like personal, personal productivity, like on your computer. So you install it on your computer and you can just record like a macro of clicking around on different screens and opening different apps and things, and it records that and that becomes your flow. Wow. on your desktop yeah so it's kind of tricky like um if i so you can use things that aren't necessarily um microsoft products like if i have a website that has all my students in it and i need to go search for a certain user and then go click on them and then go to a certain screen it has nothing to do with microsoft 365 and then it take their email address and copy it and paste it to a spreadsheet like it's all disparate systems but yeah. power automate desktop can just let you record all those actions and it's kind of like a macro on steroids because it remembers not just that I clicked in a certain spot on the screen, but like on a web page, it's actually recording like the code behind the web page in the exact spot where you clicked. And so it's much smarter and it has Copilot built in too. So when you're coming to, when you, when you get to personal pros, personal productivity, you can't even, I don't think you can even really necessarily share the, it's not easy to share a power automate desktop flow, but, um, as far as just automating what you you are personally doing all day long and just little tasks that you find to be rote, that's a good one um, to try out to go install it on your computer and just create a new flow and just click record and just record your steps. I've not so, I've yeah. not experimented with it. I've not investigated. So the scenario that I had about every time I have a new blog post going live, so in theory, you could go and do that. Look at the yeah. who is the guest, go and then look up, create a new email grab the link to the url to the blog post dump that in there send here's the format of that um and once you build that logic and of course it can say like whenever had the trigger be whenever there's the new post and uh and go and pull down i format them the same way so it should be yeah. able to find the name and and all that yeah yeah it's got hundreds of triggers and actions and like very very specific things you can do like in spreadsheets on web pages it's it's kind of a pain when it comes to clicking in a certain spot on a web page. I find that to be kind of buggy, but uh, but yeah, otherwise, otherwise, especially like actions in spreadsheets across like other systems. That's what I, I I envision as the future to a lot of this, like with Copilot, to be able to again using natural language go in there and say, hey, I want these complex multiple sites, multiple applications, but here is, this is this repeatable process. Um, oh yeah. To, to just be and, able to say, when I do this, I want you to do this and just say it in natural language and have it just, just, just go create that. That, yep. yeah, that would be scary, but cool. Do you ever, do you have uh, clients? Have you had conversations where they had uh, concerns around kind of the, the ethical considerations of some of these solutions do you ever get into that topic um no like ai you mean well i mean with ai yeah i guess uh, mostly ai i mean i know that's where a, a lot of the a lot of the productivity and automation discussion is going towards ai solutions. no i've never had an ethical discussion about any of that um mostly mostly what i hear is just people you know being scared that ai is listening to you and recording things we well, don't is. know 
And it then, is. And I like love if you it, mentioned it's some topic. Most, <laughs> it's one of the most wonderful things in my life. So when the overlords <laughs> take over, you know, I will be a good citizen. <laughs> you're like, uh, yeah. <laughs> don't get angry. I mean, always talk nice. Use Like you're having a conversation with somebody about a certain topic. And then the next day your phone shows you an ad based on that exact thing. And you're, you're just, yeah, are you listening. Well, it's, it, you know, as much as they say that they're not listening and then they have this with like the Amazon device and everything, like, again, this has been discussion out there for a couple of years now, but then, and I'm just like, oh yeah. And, and I have, I'm constantly reassuring my wife who's like, I go on a road trip. And she unplugs the devices. So I got to want them listening in. I'm like, well, what are you doing that you're worried that they're going to listen in? Like, what, that's what the you, wrong what, attitude, Christian. I know. Your no, wife is right. That's, that's the joke. <laughs> no, but, uh, but, but then once in a while, and you're just ha having a conversation or you're sitting there reading or something. And then suddenly she'll speak up and be like, like, what? Was I talking to you? <laughs> what triggered? I, I didn't mention you at all. I didn't come close to saying your name. But uh, yeah, so the, the not listening, like, mm, yeah, they're passively listening, always passively listening. And who like, knows? I want to get one of those new robots that come, that you can buy that walks around your house and like does the laundry and the dishes. That would be amazing. Those those new things Elon Musk is building. Yeah. <laughs> but I wouldn't want it listening all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know about that. Hmm. Yeah. That, that, that concerns me. Hey, uh, but yeah, no, I think that you know, looking at the future trends of this, I mean, uh, do you see, um, I don't know how much we could get into, obviously, um, both of us are uh, privy to, you know, NDA discussions around, around where things are going, but specifically around power platform, what do you see as kind of the the, the future? Where Where is it going? What, are there any gaps that you see? Um. I think that uh, it seems like Microsoft is trying to make it easier, like Power Apps specifically. It seems like Microsoft is trying to make it less time consuming to build apps. So, because uh, you, you find yourself doing things like just lining up icons, say, like on the top of a screen, and then you have to go to every screen and do and just like wrote things like that that you're doing, trying to make your app nice and uniform that just take hours and hours. So Microsoft's put a lot, like a lot of these modern controls and like containers and things they put in there to try and mitigate that and make and make it just less time consuming to build apps and um, a little bit easier. So it's it, it seems like that's the direction they're going. They're trying to make it more approachable to people mm -hmm. um, because it is quite a time sink. Um, but and they're also making it more approachable uh, in Power Automate, like with, with having AI in there, just being able to type. Hey, I want my flow to do this or this, and you can kind of do that in Power Apps too. But to have it kind of explain to you what things mean, and so um, my, it seems like Microsoft's trying to make the Power Power Apps and Power Automate are the main parts of the Power Platform that I know. Um, it seems like it's tr they're trying to make it easier, but they're also trying to make it more they're making it more approachable to like end users, power users, but they're also making it more approachable to devs. I'm not a dev but they've added the capability of having, or being able to put code in your power apps mm -hmm. and to be able to do things um, that devs like to do, like deploy from dev to test to production and, and different things like that and have a lot of that built in mm -hmm. and have, because it, it, um, it makes it more um, sort of a formal process. So now they've given you the ability to not only just kind of click the create app button and just start creating apps, but also if you want to have that more formal process, if your company requires that, they've made sure to put all that in so that they're going to get buy-in from big companies that like to have structure, but also from just kind of like smaller companies with people that just want to quickly click a couple of buttons and create an app and just build a business process. Well, the, um, I always say that I struggle where I say that the, you know, no, no code is a lie. There's it's low code uh, because when you get in and add any kind of complexity to it, to get into there, like where I struggled and I realized, I said, look, it's just not the space that I work in is, is uh, modifying the logic. If I'm able to go in, as you said, use the natural language. And if it's able to go and understand, okay, I understand what you're trying to do. And based on that, um, here is the the logic the, here's the code to do that thing to do that that natural language i mean this this 
reminds me of um, the, this this line of discussion of where like rational software was 25 years ago um, with their visual modeling and rational rows and the idea that I could use the unified, I don't know if you were ever into this space, but you know, UML, the unified modeling language to go and build, to outline, to draw a picture of here are my users, here's the scenarios, here's the flow of this activity and you build it digitally, this drawing. And from that, it would generate that base code of like your visual diagram. Basic, is that it wasn't, no, it was, it was, it was oh. uh, it's, oh, it's now, it's all owned by IBM. So it wasn't in the Microsoft ecosystem. Oh. But, uh, but again, this idea of the unified modeling language was a notation, a way of, of defining a problem to go and be solved. You put it, you get it down to the, the basic components, you know, the users, uh, the, the, the different artifacts, the, the nodes of this system, this action, define what the action is, build scenarios, but then you can start building, you know, adding those pieces together. And the idea of that product was that it could then generate basic code from which, which solves the fundamental issue that you're trying to solve. But then you go out, it had to be cleaned up. It had to, you know, to, to, to get it, to be able to roll it out in production. It wasn't ready to, to build and go, um, you know, a code, but this was 25 years ago to go and do that. And now we're at a place where you can, you know, um, using your voice or type it in, you know, say in natural language, this is what I want you to go and do. And Copilot can go and generate code. Again, it's not perfect. You need to test yeah. it. You need to play with it. You need to change it around. Um, yeah. There are ghosts in the machine, you know? So. <laughs> yeah, that that's, that's interesting about Power Apps though, because because Power Apps has a few simple things you can do. And I have a free Power Apps Basics class on, at iwmentor.com that anyone can go take. I also have a Power Apps Advanced class and it's about 12 hours long. When you get to about halfway through, it starts getting really advanced. And that's when you kind of start going off the Power Apps cliff, as my husband calls it. He works in Power Apps all day long. Mm -hmm. And it's like, this is easy. This is easy. This all makes sense. And then it starts getting really complex when you want to start yeah. like putting a lot of logic in there. So it's called the Power Apps cliff. But uh, I've had, I put a few modules in my training about, um, about Copilot and how you can ask it questions and what the interface is like. Um, so when people ask me to put more Copilot in the training, it, it makes me think, well, Copilot is kind of helping you out. And it's really just, if you, if you learn the actual fundamentals and learn what some of these important functions are and how they work and where are they, and where they where they need to be in your app, and you, you just learn, <laughs> learn this stuff then you won't have to rely on asking Copilot every single question because you'll just know these fundamental concepts. So I'm kind of torn between like putting a ton of Copilot content out where it's just whatever your product and you can ask it questions and as opposed to learning some of this more complex, like how the logic works and just then not needing to have that. So does that make sense? Well, that's, yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, you, you should, I think that's a, uh, and that, that's, that's actually a, you know, that with all of the like prompt engineering training, yeah. you know, that have popped yeah. up and things around that, um, I, it's still, you, you need to be, to know the difference between di different functions, how the solutions work, where your which data, where the data is, yeah. and then how to best access that data to be able to create the strongest prompts to be able to draw it out quickly. So there's still knowledge that, that has to happen there. So I'm not discouraging yeah. people at all to go and- There's a point where my laziness ends and yeah. I really do need to just learn the thing, you know? <laughs> yeah, but there's still a lot to do. Like uh, There's so again, many products too, to learn. Yeah. So Copilot is helpful in that. And I think I think there's a lot that, I mean, the, look at the future of where, you know, Copilot is going in relation to power platform and, and automation solutions. I mean, I could see that it gets a lot smarter. So it is able to understand and self-correct. We're going to have fewer errors in the solution. You still need to have some level of governance. If you're going to do more than, if I go and build a solution for myself, just for my workspace with the data I have access to, I'm not causing any more damage 
than other than, oh, it didn't work. It didn't pull back the results that I thought and things. When you look at if, if I get it working and somebody in the company says, I love what you built. I want to scale that out. I mean, to be able to go and say, take a completed solution and said, hey, Copilot, I want to scale this out so anyone in the company could utilize this solution for it to go in and look at yeah. the code, look at the architecture and say, to enable it, you'd have to overcome these things or just to go do those things. That's so mind-blowing. Yeah, yeah, that's so mind-blowing. I mean, we're I getting there the quickly. For like I only use really, really for creative things. Like I'm yeah. creating a slide deck. I'll say, you know, give me four bullet points on this topic and it can generate, or if I'm creating, you know, uh, marketing verbiage for emails. And I love create, I, I use it a ton for stuff like that, but like what you're talking about and like Copilot in Azure and with Active Directory and that, that just is mind blowing to me. Like what's, yeah. what they're, what they're putting out there and what's going to be possible with that. That's why I think scaling, it's, it's scaling up an app. There, it, it has, it has, uh, um, there's work to be done. It's not there yet. I, you know, but it's, it's moving so much faster than you'd think. I mean, we might be, you know, a year and a half away from having it fully automated, recognize like your tone, your voice only take action based on Laura, your, your instructions versus somebody in kind of trying to edit it without authorization. I mean, we're, we're very close to having that kind of, that stuff like yeah. just like um like the star trek the universal translator like we're very close maybe it's instead of it a button on your shirt that i'm you know tapping like hello um but through your phone yeah. um to be able to go and automatically uh, uh do the translation uh feed the voice into you know an earphone but walk around in a foreign land and have enough of it you know on your device even without yeah. uh wi-fi access without cell data um, be able to translate basic things and be able to walk around in a foreign country and understand people and communicate back with them. I mean, we're very close. Yeah, that's some cool stuff. Any any practical advice here? Last question for you. Like practical advice on adoption. When you see where you see people struggling the most with automation. Adopting automation? Yeah. Do you see? Um, do you see areas? I mean, we talked a little bit about that cliff with power apps. Mm -hmm. Do you um, see other areas where or patterns of behavior where people struggle? Yeah. I mean, I've had people come to me and say, Hey, I want to do some flows. What should I create? Well, that's not really, that's not really the question you should be asking. The question to ask yourself to kind of figure out where to get started is what am I doing that's that's rote and boring and and waste my time so that I can do be doing more valuable things with my time, and then that is what you need to automate. So you know if I need to send fifteen different emails on a Monday morning to my customers, like that's the kind of thing you need to figure out. Like what, how can I create a flow that does that, or what would the trigger be, and then um, kind of go from there. That's so it's think about think about specifically what task you're doing that's uh that you need it, to automate isn't that funny like i just said this yesterday in another uh in a project management show with uh, sharon weaver we we're talking about um uh like the the age-old engineering problem is uh you need to first define the problem before you then go create the solution and yeah. so now with with all these automation technologies it's like everybody is a junior engineer out there. You're like, you're able to go build solutions, but you don't solve that fundamental problem of you need to know what you're solving before you try to solve it. Yeah. And then when you get beyond the personal stuff, it's think about like the person walking around the office, handing out a form to people. And then when they sign it, they're walking to the other office and bringing it there. And like those kind of things, that's where you get to building more like business processes that involve like the whole department or even the whole company and that kind of thing that you can make anything, something that's paper or something that's just like a, like a read only PDF, like make that an actual digital form. And so that the forms are my favorite thing. So like taking yeah. a form and making it digital and automating that whole process and getting people to think about what that process is, as opposed to, well, I bring it to Dan's office on a Wednesday, but if he's not there, I bring it to Steve. Well, how we have to figure out how to automate all that. Yeah. yeah. 
I, I forgot to mention this earlier when you were listing off talking about forms and kind of the other various tools, another of the which tool when, but you also have a uh, Viva Pulse. So you have mm -hmm. other part of the Viva suite, you have survey tools and things, right. which is, yeah. And so Forms it's just, has surveys too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there are, yeah, it, it's, uh, that's an interesting space. I actually have a new session that I'm giving in Stockholm in December on that topic. So it's, I'll more be there. Of a, it's more of a Viva. Oh, you're gonna be there. All right. Yeah. I'll be, I'll be there as well. I'll be doing uh, community reporters again, but I've got, I have two sessions, so I'm looking forward to, to being back. Yeah. Let's hang out. Well, it's great. Well, I, I'm sure I'll see you in Las Vegas before that, the power platform. DC. Conference. Yeah. DC for the tech con. No, I'll be, I'll, be, yeah, I'll be at the power platform conference and then in Stockholm. Okay. You're not doing Dallas tech no. con. Huh? All right. Well, I'll be, I'll be at that one. Can't make it to DC next month. Okay. Well, Laura, as always, great to catch up. Uh, thank you again for being a guest on the, on the Cloud Talk podcast. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Collab Talk podcast. New episodes are published weekly, and you can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcast, iHeartRadio, and most other podcast platforms. Thanks for listening. Thank you.